Buckley. I'm really glad to have this chance to share the Word of God with you. I'd like you to get out a Bible, open to John chapter 12. The title of this message is A Resurrection Celebration. It's not the celebration of Jesus' resurrection. It's the celebration of the reality that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. Now Jesus is returning to Bethany for the first time. He's gathered with Martha and Mary and Lazarus and a group of other people. It's right before the Passover, and they are going to celebrate the Passover, um, but they're also going to celebrate the reality that Lazarus is alive. He's been transformed from the grave to a regular guy, nice and healthy. So I'm going to read the first eight verses here for you. John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Okay, I'm going to teach through these verses now, and hopefully they'll come alive to you a little bit. The first verse again. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Bethany was right outside of Jerusalem, just a, two miles outside, uh, not that long of a walk actually. And Jesus was coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. So six days before the Passover, where Jews were coming from all over Israel, because all the males gathered in Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate the major feasts, and Passover was the major feast, the first of the major feasts. So Jesus is there with his disciples, and it's a really special time. He knows that he's going to the cross. He knows that this is the last week of his time on the earth as a regular man anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's going to come back raised from the dead, but he's not going to hang out with Lazarus and Martha and Mary anymore. So these are the people he really loved. These are people he looked forward to celebrating holidays with. And because Lazarus was now alive, it made this a very special occasion. It says in verse 2, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Now, if you remember the story of Martha and Mary told in the book of Luke, Martha was serving a meal when Jesus was present in their house, and she was really upset because Mary wasn't helping her. Mary, she said, who was just sitting at the feet of Jesus, come on, like we, we've got a lot of work to do and it's all fallen on me. So she was really frustrated. But now, after Lazarus is raised from the dead, Martha has a totally different attitude. She is still serving. And Mary is about to do something extraordinary, which we're going to focus on. Martha is still serving. So serving, using your hands and your feet and your strength to produce a meal or to set up a meeting or to clean up a, a mess because your fellowship has gotten together and when a bunch of people get together, there's messes involved. Serving with the right attitude is a beautiful thing to do. She had the right attitude now and Mary is about to do something amazing. The dinner was in Jesus' honor. Lazarus was there at the table. Uh, and I can imagine Lazarus is just the happiest guy in the room because he's alive and Jesus is back and they're all together again. Uh, it's possible Lazarus was 
signing autographs for people. It's possible that he was telling the story over and over. It's possible that uh, people say, hey, can I really touch you? Because I, I came by when you were really sick, and then I came by again, and your sisters were weeping and crying, and Jesus hadn't showed up, and this is my first time to actually see you. Can, would you mind if I just touch you? You know, who knows what was going on, but Lazarus was a happy guy. It says, then in verse 3, Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary takes this perfume, pure nard, and it was extremely valuable. She doesn't just sprinkle a little bit on Jesus. She doesn't just touch his cheek or touch his cloak or touch his head. She literally pours it on him, and it's all over him. I, I believe she poured it from the top of his head, and it went all the way down to his feet. Or maybe she just poured it in several places at once. But then she's at his feet, and she takes her hair and begins to rub his feet with her hair with the oil of this nard on his feet. Now, to me, that is a very sensuous thing to do. I mean, if, if a, a woman in our fellowship poured perfume on me and wanted to wipe my feet with her hair, I would be uh, pretty amazed and probably would say no. But Jesus did not say no. He received it. Because Jesus would never get married. He would never be sexually involved with a woman. But he was a man. And I'm sure he liked to be hugged. I'm sure he liked to kiss on the cheek. I'm sure that this extravagant devotion that Mary was showing to him, that was, was making his feet just literally tingle with sensation, I'm sure that it really touched him. Because this body that he had, the the body of a man was about to be crucified. And prior to coming into this house, which he knew would be his last celebration dinner with the people that he loved so much, his really good friends, he was thinking about what was going to happen to his body. And this was Mary's way of showing and God's way of showing through Mary, I really care about you and your body, and I know your body can feel pleasure, and I know your body can feel pain, but I don't want you to get too fixated on the pain because you are deeply loved. You are deeply appreciated because Mary loved her brother, Lazarus, and Lazarus, who she had wept over, is now alive because Jesus had done a miracle. So she was going to honor the man who did the miracle to restore her family. She was didn't care what anybody thought, what anybody felt. Now, it's probable that because banking systems were not really very advanced and maybe not even very trustworthy, it's possible that the savings account of Martha and Mary was this perfume. It's possible that this was a treasure that they had invested in because it was portable. You could literally put it in your purse or in your pocket and carry it with you if you were going on a trip so that nobody broke into your house and stole the thing of greatest value that you owned. It's possible that this was the greatest value possession that they had. And it's possible that they were moved to give it to Jesus, not as a gift in the sense of here, take it, but we are going to cover your whole body with it. Jesus knew that he was going to be dying. They had probably heard that as well. And so they took advantage of this opportunity to give him something extravagant. And I want to talk to you for a moment about extravagant gifts. There's a timing for everything in life that's really important. If you're hungry, there's a timing for a really good meal. You know, if you're thirsty, the, uh, an offer of some cold water is really nice. If you're lonely, if you're depressed, a hug or a call of encouragement at the right time can lift you, strengthen you, and bless you. 
And if you're contemplating the reality that you're going to die as Jesus was, this kind of a gift was really, really special. I have some friends that have given very special gifts over the years. When I was a young believer, I went to see a friend that uh, was my best friend in the latter part of my high school years. His name was Larry Bresnan. And um, Larry was following Jesus. He was the guy that witnessed to me. He was the guy that, that urged me to give my life to Jesus Christ in 1969 when I was 19 years old. And I, I argued with him and I wrestled with the idea. And after he had left and headed up towards Oregon, uh, I did accept Jesus. And I asked him to be the Lord of my life. I asked him to forgive my sins. I quit running away from God. I quit being afraid of what would happen to my life if I really gave it to God. I, I was afraid that I'd never be able to get stoned again. I was afraid I'd never be able to be involved in immorality again. Well, guess what? If you're worried about those kind of things, you're going to be so glad when your mind is free from the ravages of drug use, when your conscience is clear and you're not worried about sexual relations and, and the entanglements that come outside of marriage and whether you got a disease or whether you got somebody pregnant or whether you got uh, guilt that's going to last a long time because you're breaking up with somebody that's now hurt because of you. Anyway, my friend Larry goes up to Oregon. I had given my life to Jesus, so I went up to Oregon to see him and to tell him what had happened to me. And he's living on this commune, and all the people there are following Jesus. And here's what's happened. What's happened is down in Los Angeles, there was a family, and the family had a son, and their son had a diagnosis of death. He was dying. And they take their son to a meeting where somebody prays over him, a man who was preaching the gospel and who believed in the gift of healing prays over their son and their son gets healed. And they are so ecstatic. Instead of a dead son, now they have a very much alive son and they want to do something to show God how thankful they are. So they sold what they had in Los Angeles and they bought about 20 acres in Oregon, Southern Oregon, off of Highway 5. And they, they had a house on the property and they started building other houses and they opened it up to anybody. They called it living water. Anybody who wanted to come and follow Jesus. All the hippies were traveling up and down the West Coast in the late 60s and early 70s. And they just invited him, come and stay with us. And they would tell him about Jesus and they would, they would provide him a place to stay. And it was a really beautiful thing. It was an extravagant gift that they were giving back to the Lord because the Lord gave their son back to them. And when I went to stay at that commune to, to tell Larry I'm now following Jesus, they had a profound impact on me. A whole community of people who loved God and who started loving me and sharing the word of God for me and praying for me and laying hands on me and asking God to bless me. And that made me want to be a wholehearted disciple. Their extravagant gift was beginning to bear fruit in incredible ways. I have another friend. Her name is Alicia Hansen. Some of you have heard me tell this story. But she was with my son Matthew in 1992 on June 1st when they were tubing down the Salt River and Matt fell out of his tube and uh, he got tangled in the ropes as the river went around a bend and he got sucked down by a vortex and Alicia and the other tubers had pulled over to the side and they wondered what happened to Matthew and they're trying to pull on the ropes and eventually they had to get a sheriff's boat to pull him out of the river and he was dead. They, they were able to restart his heart so he, he got to live three more days in a coma in the hospital before he died once and for all. His brain had been destroyed. He had been underwater for 20 minutes. So Alicia, who was a non-believer, who had come to Living Streams the day before, and hadn't been all that impressed, sees the love of God poured out at that hospital, where our friends came by the hundreds to pray for Matt for those three days that he was in the coma, to love on Christina and I, to weep with us as we wept for our son. She sees the love of God, as did many of Matt's other friends. She gives her life to Jesus. Fast forward a number of years. She marries this Catholic believer named Jamie Hansen, they have a 
daughter together. And they're very happy with their daughter. And a year or so later, she gets pregnant again. This time, she develops a cyst, an ovarian cyst. And the doctors, when she goes and says she's got these problems and some kind of pain, they investigate. They said, to save your life, we need to take the baby and we need to remove your ovaries right now or you're going to die from this cancer. So she and her husband pray about it. And as they pray about it, they feel like the Lord says to them that they're to trust him, that they're to to give their lives, to make themselves vulnerable for the sake of this baby. They don't want the baby to die. So they tell the doctors, the doctors are like, okay, we warned you, her family is sort of freaking out, like you're more important to us than this unborn child. Long story short, she has the baby. After the baby is born healthy, she has a partial uh, hysterectomy where they remove one ovary and they tell her, don't ever get pregnant again because the same hormones that stimulate the pregnancy, um, that stimulate the growth of the baby will potentially bring this cancer back. But Alicia has a desire to give an extraordinary gift to Jesus, because he has saved her. He has forgiven her. He has delivered her from a life of futility, from a life of guilt and shame, and given her a man who loves her, and given her now two little children who she loves, and she decides to trust God, and she gets pregnant again, much to the consternation of some of the people who are trying to advise her, and she has another healthy child, and then she gets pregnant again. And then again, she now has six healthy children and she is healthy herself. Because not not to say that the doctors are always wrong or that every time that they tell a believer to do something, the believer should just ignore it because God's more powerful and wiser than any doctor. It's not that. It's the fact that the Lord told her it's going to be okay. Even though your body is manifesting this cancer, it's going to be okay. She made herself available to give the gift of life to these six children, and they are a blessed family because of it. It was an extraordinary gift. It was an amazing gift. I have another friend who's now in heaven. Her name is Jan Dow. I've talked about her over the years, and I want to just tell one little quick story from her life. Her children had grown up Scott and Roseanne were her two kids. Her husband, Lloyd, loved her. They both loved Jesus. They were part of our church in Northern California. And it was Jan's birthday. And she invited Christina and I to come over for dinner. And we knew that she had invited some other friends as well. (coughs) And I got there and there were a few people that I had never met before there. And and I introduced myself and, and Jan was sitting on the chair and just had the biggest smile on her face. And I said, well, where's Lloyd? And she said, well, he's out getting other people. I said, oh, who's that? And she said, well, I just sent him into the town of Nevada to find people to come to my birthday, anybody, anybody who needed a place to go to have a nice meal. And she had roasted a giant turkey and she had made a big feast and she wanted her house filled, not just with her believer friends, but with non-believers so they could experience the love of somebody who would welcome them for a special meal, welcome them into her family, welcome them to celebrate her birthday. No presence desired, just the presence of the people. And I thought that was so special because that's exactly what Jesus told us to do when we hold a feast. He says, don't just invite your friends and family because they'll invite you back and then you've got your reward. Invite the poor and the lame and the blind, people who will never be able to invite you back. And that's when you're going to have a great reward from God. That's what Walt and Lewin Rattray have done. They've given an extraordinary gift to some of you and to me by loving us, by creating church on the street, by creating an environment where people can come and live and share their lives together and and find Jesus and, and be taught and have vision and purpose and meaning and the power of God in their lives. Instead of emptiness and shame and degradation, you become children of God because they chose not just to 
take the salvation for themselves and find out the the biggest, best house they could buy and the, the best boat and the nicest golf courses. No, they decided that they would have a family, not natural children, but supernatural children, the, the children that God would give them. And some of you are those people. That's an extraordinary gift. There's Christian couples by the thousands that never have their own children, but they don't do that. They might have somebody over on Christmas or Thanksgiving. They might, you know, go feed the homeless once or twice or occasionally, but they don't make it their life mission to bring you into their family. That is an extraordinary gift. So continuing on with this story, it says the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. It was powerful, wonderful. It's like operatic music, you know, that's reverberating, except it's the smell of this extraordinary gift. But then conflict comes. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. So what, what's a year's wages? I mean, $50,000, $100,000, $30,000, it's a year's worth of labor, probably calculated at six days a week, probably calculated at a 10 to 12 hour day. You can do the math, but it's a lot of money. It's very, very valuable. So there's conflict. There's conflict right there among the early disciples because In some of the other accounts of this same story, it appears that some of the other disciples actually agreed with Judas. Like, yeah, yeah, why wasn't this fragrant perfume sold? Think of all we could have done. Jesus would have probably been happy with, you know, a $50 bottle of perfume. That would have been pretty nice. That would have been reasonable. Think of how much we could have done. But again, it's the occasion, it's the timing, it's the reality that Jesus wouldn't always be with them. And here's how we explain it. First of all, it says Judas didn't care. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to put himself, help himself to what was put into it. And and a lot of financial disputes are really the result of somebody's bad motives. Somebody is ripping people off. A lot of theological disputes are really the result of bad motives. Either somebody's trying to hide their immorality, or they're trying to control the flock of God by making you think that their particular interpretation, whether it's an end time teaching or a particular interpretation of one event or another is so darn important that you better not even trust anybody who has any other way of interpreting these events. And let me tell you, unless we're talking about the foundational truths of salvation that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, for our sins so that they can be completely forgiven, that Jesus was born of the Virgin, crucified under Pontius Pilate, and three days later he was raised from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the Father. Unless we're talking about these foundational truths of the Scripture, it's not worth dividing the body of Christ over. And when people start doing that, they're oftentimes covering for their own fears, their own inadequacies. They're trying to control you. They don't want you free to fellowship across the denominational lines and to ever really experience the fullness of Christ, which we can only experience when we're in fellowship with people beyond our own circle. So Jesus says in verse 7 of John 12, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. This is the purpose for which she gave the gift, for to this is a sign that I'm about to be buried. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. There's a timing for every gift. My friend, um, his name is Bob Ellison, years ago gave a special gift. It was like $20,000. 
to help us buy a farm in Petaluma where we were doing discipleship ministry and the farm had a number of buildings on it. And because we were able to use this $20,000 down, we were able to purchase this farm. And for the first time, we had a place to take the people we won to Christ when we were out doing street evangelism. And it was an awesome ministry. We later built a house on the property. We later put a, a trailer on the property so it grew in value. And when we sold that, and, and we sold it, you know, literally 30 years ago, otherwise uh, it would be worth a lot more today. But when we sold it, we got about $500,000 out of that initial $20,000 plus a little extra money was put in as well. So let's say we put in 50, 60, or even 100,000, but we sold it for 500,000, five times as much as we had invested in it. And we had years and years of fruitful ministry. And we took the 500,000 then and bought a nice church building in downtown, which is still going today as a place where the gospel is being preached. Incredible fruitfulness from one timely gift. We had another guy give us a gift. He gave us a $3,000 gift in 1971 and the $3,000 gift he gave to our ministry and we took it and used it to start a Christian general store because in our entire county, there was no uh, store where you could go and buy a Bible, buy books about Christ and about the gospels, find Christian music and that sort of thing. This was before the internet. There was no Amazon or anything like that. You had to literally go to a bookstore to buy a book if you wanted a book. I mean, it sounds antiquated today, but so we had took the $3,000 and we did some investigations. The investigation uh, said that we should have closer to $20,000 for first and last month's rent and the right amount of inventory. But we took this, what we felt was an extravagant gift bought all the books we could, put first and last months, used volunteer labor, and that bookstore, the Christian General Store, grew and it prospered. As the years went on, the inventory grew to over $100,000 worth of books and Bibles and Sunday school supplies in uh, San Rafael, California. It served the entire county. And then we were able to launch a bookstore in San Francisco and another one in Nevada and another one in Petaluma and another one in Sonoma all because of that one special gift. It's amazing what can happen when somebody makes a sacrificial gift. Now, I'm saying that because somebody listening to me is probably being called to make an extraordinary gift, a sacrificial gift. And it may be like Walt and Lewin, where you decide you're going to open your home, you're going to open your life, and you're going to give yourself to the family of God. It may be like my friend Alicia, where she's going to have babies, regardless of what anybody thinks. She and her husband are in agreement, and they're going to give life to those children. It may be the kind of gift that allows somebody to buy property or to start a business that can promote the gospel. It can be according to the measure of your faith and your generosity, something incredibly powerful, incredibly significant. It can multiply the power of the gospel that's being released. Okay, in verse 9 it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So all these people are showing up, not just to see Jesus, but oh, Lazarus is here. I want to touch him. Lazarus, hey, I want to talk to you, man. Is this real or what? You know, what was it like to be dead? You know, did you just feel like you were asleep or did you see any great white lights or what was it all about? People have a lot of questions. Lazarus was an interesting guy to talk to. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. That's sort of interesting. Wow, I'd love to go through what Lazarus went through. Wow, what an opportunity. Well, you want people to try and kill you too because that's how they were responding. They decided, since they hated Jesus, that they better get rid of Lazarus at the same time. Why would they hate Jesus for bringing somebody back from the dead? Why would they hate Jesus who taught about loving your enemies? 
Why would they hate a man who is preaching, forgive others, and your heavenly Father will forgive you, but if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven? Why would they hate somebody that was healing lepers and feeding hungry people? Why? Why? Well, sometimes people's hearts are dark. Sometimes they're wicked. Sometimes they're mad. Sometimes they're jealous. Sometimes they feel that anybody who threatens their position of security uh, needs to be eliminated. And it's tragic, very tragic. And it, that kind of behavior is still going on to this day. So Lazarus had an awesome miracle that he experienced, but he also paid a price. Now, as this chapter goes on, there's some great teaching, and I'm not going to get into it now because I don't have time, but I want to encourage you to finish up John chapter 12. And right now, I just want to focus on the last four verses of this chapter. John 12, starting in verse 47, this is what Jesus said. If anyone hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, whenever Jesus does something extraordinary, whenever there's a miracle like the raising of Lazarus, which happened in John chapter 11, you can be sure that his teaching is going to penetrate the hearts of the people in a special way. So he's going to teach some things that are really significant. And this is one of them. He said, if anybody doesn't keep my word, I'm not judging them. I did not come here to judge them. So some of you go out and you share your faith with non-believers. And some of you know that whether or not they listen to the message you are bringing them, it's going to be very consequential in their life. If they don't repent, there's going to be serious repercussions. When, when I was sharing my faith in the 70s and the early 80s in California, we ran into a lot of people who are living a homosexual lifestyle, and we called them to repentance. We also called hippies who were living in heterosexual immorality to repentance. And we called white, older, rich people to repentance and black, poor people or rich people to repentance. We called everybody to repentance. That's my point. However, many of those people who did not repent got AIDS and they died. Even one guy that was in our ministry who um, backslid into the homosexual lifestyle got AIDS and he died. There were major consequences for rejecting the word of God. But listen to what Jesus said again. If anyone hears my word but does not keep them, I do not judge that person because I did not come to judge. So it's about our attitude because we're bringing the word of God to people now. Our job is not to judge them. He goes on to say there will be a judgment for them, but that's not our job. Knowing what God's job is, and knowing what our job is, is really, really important. Because other, if we get it confused, we come across as hateful. If we get it confused, we come across as mean and angry. We're taking something personal that even Jesus himself did not do. He couldn't have maintained a loving attitude if he said, I want you to repent, the kingdom of God is here. I told you, you needed to repent. You are going to be in big trouble. You are going to burn in hell because you won't repent. He did not go there. He did not make those judgments. He said there in verse 48, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. There is a judge and he is God the Father. And when we stand before God the Father, we're going to be judged on the basis of how did we respond to the words of Christ? The word of repentance, the word of generosity, the word of forgiveness, the word of love. Did we actively love our neighbors or did we despise them and, and were jealous of them? Did we actively 
love them like we love ourselves? Did we want the best for them or not? Were we willing to sacrifice for them or not? Those words will be the words that the Father will use to judge us. But Jesus didn't come to judge. And so when you share your faith with people and they don't respond, do not judge them. Pray for them. They're going to need it. They're going to be responsible for the words that they've heard. But it's not our job to judge. For I did not speak on my own, he says in verse 49, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Jesus said, this isn't just my message. I'm saying what the Father commanded me to say. I'm doing what the Father commanded me to do. I got in a big dispute years ago with some brothers. This was like in the late 80s. And they wanted to remove me from the ministry the board that we were on. And uh, it was a non-paying position, but it over, we were overseeing the different churches in our movement. But I was, I, I was sort of angry in those days. I was frustrated. I was sleep deprived. I was making life miserable for the guy who was president of our missionary corporation. And so he talked to some people and they decided that I would have to step off the board. And I was really offended because I had helped plant some of the churches. I thought I had made a good contribution. And I'm praying about whether just to quit the group altogether. And as I was praying about it, the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, Mark, what have I commanded you to do? And I said, well, you've commanded me to love my brothers. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, you've commanded me to forgive my brothers. Anything else? Well, you've commanded me to serve my brothers. Now, it wasn't like God spoke from heaven and said, this. these are just the clear commands in Scripture for all believers. To love, to forgive, to serve. Greatest among you will be like the servant of all. Those are clear commands to all believers. And then... The Lord asked me another question. Have I commanded you to be in charge, be the president, be on the board? Have I commanded that? I'm like, no, but you know, no, no, sort of like, uh, well, <laughs> Jesus said, here, I do what the Father commanded me because that's what leads to eternal life. So I was just talking two days ago with the guy who removed me from the board. You know we're really good friends. You know that he's invited me to come and preach to his church many, many times and to do men's retreats for his church many times and that we have had a great relationship for the last 25 years since I chose to accept the demotion and just love and serve and forgive. And so I'm saying this to wrap up this message. One of the great extravagant gifts that Jesus has given to each of us is his word. And his word empowers us. It directs us. It gives light and understanding to us. And we need light and understanding. And our world needs light and understanding. People need to come to the light. And they're not going to see the light if we're judges. We're, they're not going to see the light if we are withholding the gifts that God wants us to give. If we're not willing to make ourselves vulnerable. So go ahead and make yourself available to Jesus. Give whatever you have to give because the kingdom of God is here and his will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the day the Lord's made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. God bless you.